Thank you. Thank you very much. We will continue with today's agenda with one of the most interesting movies in the world of animation worldwide. Uh, you have to say things freely if you think them. And we also thank you for the effort that you make because you have just presented your movie at uh, Los Angeles F uh, Film Festival um, that actually is demanding a greater presence of animation in the movies. And it's actually right now being played in, the, in movie theaters in Spain. So you should go and, and watch it now, today, if you can. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you all. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you. I would like to thank the region of Madrid. Thank you, Manuel, for having Unicorn Wars um, here this morning. I would like to thank the Academy for the space that they have provided us with. And and as Manuel was saying during the introduction, I am here today representing the whole team, the technical artistic team that made this movie. Our idea was to, to have a whole journey of the process for the development of, of the movie since we started working with Alberto Vázquez, its director, until uh, October 21st, uh, last Friday, when we premiered the movie and it was in the movie theaters in Spain. So that's what we want to introduce to you, this journey. And before I begin, I would like to show you the trailer, the movie's trailer, and from then onward, we will start this journey together. We'll start traveling. Hay de quien beba la sangre del último unicornio, pues se convertirá en ser hermoso y eterno. Y así Dios regresará al paraíso perdido. Solo un osito, el elegido, realizará todo. Tal proeza. La mejor manera de matar a un unicornio es atravesar su cuello. Muerte, muerte al unicornio. Es la peor compañía que he visto en mucho tiempo. Es que la cama está súper mojada. Precisamente, Capitán Ocicos. Son perfectos. <risa> Reclutas, hoy es un día muy especial. Por fin soy soldado. ¡Hermanito! Los actos tienen consecuencias. Sargento, le requerimos a usted y a su compañía para la misión Pájaro Perdido. Mire, por aquí pasó la compañía Búho Solitario. Sargento, han desaparecido. ¡Ah, mi hermano. El unicornio, hijos míos. Fijaos contra qué luchan. Oh no, se acercan. Oh señor, protégenos en tu regazo. Nosotras somos el bosque y moriremos con él. As you have seen, this is a movie that's an animation movie that is targeting mainly an adult audience. And our idea was to provide you with a different perspective. I love um, seeing that there are so many different projects that are being produced in Spain and internationally. And our idea, as Manuel was saying during the presentation, was to create a movie that was actually cinema, where the animation is simply the technique not a genre. And that's where everything started. In 2009, I had just uh, founded our um, producing company called Unico, and I worked with Pedro Rivero, who was a director who just uh, filmed a movie called uh, La Crisis Carnivora, I think he said. And that first project that Pedro did was a disaster, and everything was done in the wrong way. And Pedro, one day, came to the office with this comic book with Psychonautas and and he said, Ivan, I've fallen in love with the story. I'm going to call Alberto, its offer, 
and I'm going to offer them the possibility of making a movie out of it. And I said, but you have just done a movie and everything went wrong. You're now going to do a second one and you're going to do everything in the same way? And we said, well, before we launch ourselves into this adventure of doing a long, a long movie, a, a long feature, I'm going to talk to, to Pedro, to Alberto. Alberto didn't have any experience in animation. He only uh, dealt with doing something that he does marvelously well, which is illustration and comic books. And the idea of, of transferring that universe that he generates to a visual uh, sector was something that that he adored. I mean, he, he loved the idea. And instead of doing everything wrong, we said, we need a renaissance. We're going to start with a short. We will see how we want to tell it. We need a strategy. And we did Verbum. So this was a short um, short feature that went very well. It was shortlisted for the Oscars. No. We learned a lot of things from him, uh, from, from it, I'm sorry. And that was the beginning of a work with Alberto where... We have done this for four movies, and then Psychonautas, and the last one that I was talking to you about, Unicorn Wars. All of these are works that take place in magic universes, and Alberto has a capacity to generate very personal universes that are artistic and very, very very personal and all of his work is is for a not an adult audience and Unicorn Wars is a collaboration with France it's an ambitious movie it's a war movie with lots of different characters with armies with dozens of unicorns and it's a very ambitious movie it mixes different kinds of genres there's comedy black comedy there's terror there's fantasy there's a war movie, and we like to define the movie using three concepts, using three references. On the one hand, there's movies such as Platoon or Apocalypse Now, where we talk about the war, and we talk about um, characters that get lost, and we talk about survival, surviving a frenetic rhythm. And on the other hand, we have uh, Alberto's universe, um, fable, magical universe where there is always a very cute part with regards to the aesthetic and in this case there's also the point of view of unicorns being represented and all of that was linked to this concept of a sacred book and legend prophecy where we explain this relationship between unicorns and bears. During this presentation I also wanted to um, have the voice of the team heard. And I wanted to introduce to you different people who have been part of this process. And we have little videos where they explain different different parts. So I'm going to show you a short video, um, Alberto's video explaining part of the movie. Unicorn Wars is a project that was born in 2010. But it was a comic book story, the story of two brothers who um, who hunt unicorns, and the idea of hunting unicorns in that tale scenario I thought was uh, fun. <coughs> Years later, we did the short uh, Unicorn Blood with uh, watercolors. So, and it was pink, blue, like the colors of the protagonists. And the idea was to uh, turn that into a movie. I was interested in having a big war movie, a homage to the big countries that have influenced me, I, that I really loved when I was a kid, such as Apocalypse Now, Platoon, uh, Metal Jacket. So. Uh, all of that had to go through the filter of my world of comic books, Sikonautas, my books, the books that I, that I do with fables and classic tales. And by mixing these two things, we have this movie um, coming, coming about. And here we have all the complexity of how, how do we have a battle with unicorns against bears? 
lots of different uh, characters. And there are 10, 11 main characters here. Lots of different scenarios, lots of unicorns, lots of battles. And all of that was the qualitative jump forward that we made, especially from the narrative point of view. I think it's an original movie that has a very personal perspective one um, in its narrative, my perspective in this case. And then it's the production is actually very good, and I think it's very entertaining, and it's going to be impactful because I think that what we tell in the story and how we tell it is something that many people don't expect. Okay, and when we had that script and we started working on the artistic part, we needed to explain those references to the team so that they knew what the movie was about. And as I was telling you, Alberto um, starts as a film um, as a filmmaker. He had a, a he already had um, Sangre de Unicornio, Blood of a Unicorn, and this is something that was done in stop motion with watercolors and the structure of uh, char of characters and that idea of Cain and Abel. And then we had an, um, engraved um, drawings, medieval illustration to narrate that part of the legend. I will explain things to you now. We'll show you parts of the prophecy and of the magical legend that has been animated and cut out. It's all with that aesthetic of um, uh, traditional engravings of the religious of of the religious um, tales. And then we have this teddy bears. This these plushies with their different physiologies, and obviously there is references to 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 uh, the care bears and and so on that are very much present in the animation world. And then the work of different artists uh, such as Scott Wills, May Wills, and who who were lots of visual references in this work, and. And then there's the element of fable and and tales that are the elements that mark the visual um, side of the movie. Then we have lots of important challenges when developing this movie. One of them is the budget. It's a three million euro movie, which considering the complexity that it has from a technical and artistic point of view, it's a very limited budget. And when we present the project outside of Spain, they usually um, are mind blown by the fact that we have such a limited budget. And then another challenge was that of having a co-production, an international co-production in the midst of the pandemic, considering the circumstances. I don't know if you'll remember, but in 2020, everything was closed down. Companies closed down, and we had to use different protocols in the uh, work environment. And we were lucky to have already used a Kitsum, which is a production software that helped us work remotely with different freelance uh, workers and different studios. Our co-production between France and Spain. In Spain, we had our studios in both Bilbao and Coruña, and then we had different professionals who were working all over Spain because they could either not uh, travel due to professional um, engagements or due to the pandemic. We also had to change uh, completely our pipeline. We came from a production process where we would do the animation on flash and then animate and and we did all of the color um, coloring and lighting on Photoshop. We did it frame by frame. And when we thought of a movie such as this one, where we have an average of five characters uh, framed in each frame, uh, it, it gives you a great complexity. And it was not something that we could do. We did um, a study of different softwares. So we analyzed all of the softwares that were available. And, and we heard about what expensive, I think he said, which has been used to develop Amarradas as well. We contacted Daniel Lara. He was the technical director for the project. And we told him, listen, 
this is what we want to do, this is what we've done up till now, but we don't know how to do it with the software. So we did a study, we did training, and after studying all the softwares in the market, we realized that that was a, the, the, the best one for our development. What did that involve? Well, training the whole team, we had to train, every, train everyone, the uncertainty, and we didn't know how it's, it was going to flow. It wasn't really the best project to do this. Obviously, we would have love to do it with a smaller project and then do this but it was the only way to do it and another handicap was the fact that any um for instance for cleanup color um, lighting we well, when we wanted to increase the number of people in that department for a very specific time it was very complicated because you needed to have someone who was going to be paid obviously but they would have to spend some time training so that they could have that learning curve and then be part of that department for that time so it was a real challenge and then also the the scarcity um you know that um uh, there weren't enough professionals. But right now we have a wonderful moment in the industry. I think that there are around 30 movies that are being developed or in post uh, from development to post-production that are being um, worked on. But that also means that there are there have to be professionals for all of those productions. And then this is a movie that is very ambitious considering all the different takes that it has. And now this is the production software that we used. Here you have all the different shots of the movie and the different um, phases, background, lighting, and what what's the moment, who's doing it, and and here we see uh, the exact moment, giving feedback to to the person working on that so that they could keep on working with that that shot. And without this tool, we would not have been able to develop this project in a co-production with different studios and at that time. Okay. How does the project start from an artistic standpoint? As Alberto was saying, it came from the illustration world, from, the, uh, from a concept. And the initial concepts are always developed by him. And this is where the whole universe is developed, the whole basic um, universe is created, where we start thinking about what these characters are like and the color study of the movie. We have seen that color is very important in Unicorn Wars. And to me, he has that, that, that skill. He, he can, with just a few things and with a technique that is not necessarily very clean, because these are not perfectly made concepts from a technical point of view, but he does give essence to the project. And I, I think you saw the teaser at the beginning. Uh, I think that there are colors very rec that are very recognizable so that the whole artistic team for backgrounds and characters can start working from, from all of that information. Once we've developed this and once our script has been approved, then we work on the storyboard. I, we work on the storyboard in a way that is, I wouldn't say completely different, but that's how we do it. And I haven't seen it anywhere else. I don't know if it's the best way, but it's the one that works for us. And we have a storyboard that is very Yazaki, you know, it's vertical. We also show some some colors as well with watercolors so that we know what sort of colors we need for each sequence and we also consider some backgrounds and how they could what they could look like and then in a very manual way and uh, it's not very finished from a technical standpoint so that we can use it later on but from an artistic point of view it does guide us quite a bit and have, after having this story this this rough study what we do is a clean we clean that story up and that's where we have a storyboard that could help us um, have that future layout and have a more worked on uh, product where the characters are, are, are better defined uh, we have the future model and here we can we can have all that layout posing and then we also mark all the color parameters for certain things. Here you have an example of what it would look like, what the final montage would look like with the animatic 
being done already over the basis of of that storyboard ¿Acaso no es verdad, hijos míos, que el osito es la verdadera creación de Dios? ¿Acaso no es verdad que el unicornio robó nuestras tierras fértiles, aquel bosque sagrado que nos pertenecía por derecho divino? ¿Acaso no es verdad que el unicornio debe morir? ¡Muerte! ¡Muerte al unicornio! ¡Muerte al unicornio! Bueno, y en paralelo... Mientras... And at the same time, while we were working on that storyboard... The pre-production uh, team worked on character development. And in this case, in this specific case, I think that anyone who's, in a, anyone who's been in a big project knows that one of the biggest challenges is to sync time. So you, you, when you co-produce at a national or international level, syncing expectations and times, because you might uh, be able to work on financing, but maybe the other part is not working on that, and maybe um, something is more fast-paced than something else, and it's complex to, to have it all um, align. In our case, there were a couple of moments where we were about to just give up and It's a project that has taken us six years, three out of which were to get financing, and then three other years were dedicated to producing the, um, the project. And during that process, I got, um, well, getting the financing for such a different and radical movie was actually very complex. In that character's um, development that we were working on, well, everything accelerated, and we started getting financing, and we had to accelerate because... Uh, Some people needed to start working at that moment. So due to a series of circumstances, we had to accelerate it all and we didn't do a character development as in-depth as we would have liked to do it. We simply had poses, expressions, turn around. We had the whole evolution of characters during the whole movie and, and lip sync and so on. But we had done it with the main characters but with the secondary characters from the military camp bears military camp there wasn't uh, such such a large development and it's something that in the um, production we managed to to solve it because of the wonderful team that we worked with but if you work in production any euro that has been invested in pre-production is savings for production so it would have been um, It would have been better if we had invested more time here in the pre-production. But here you have a sample of all of the characters. There's a difference between the bare world that has been done in 2D and the world of unicorns or the, the lady unicorns. It's 3D with a 2D finishing. As I was telling you at the beginning, it would have been impossible. I mean, it would have been possible, but with many more resources. It would have been impossible to animate in 2D all of those masses of unicorns because we have around 50, 60 unicorns in one shot sometimes. And we wanted to conceptualize how we wanted those unicorns to look like once we had rendered it and we had light, um, done the lighting for those unicorns. And this render allows you to work all of that on the 3D module and then to take it to Liz Pencil, which is the 2D module, and then you can give it a more manual finish, uh, finishing touches. And that gives the, the look and feel of the character here. We have the, uh, the the tails of the horses and the unicorns and so on, we can see the different textures. And here we have components of the magical world, characters that live there. These are characters that even if they only appear in one or two shots, it was important for us that they existed because they give it a realistic touch and magical a magical appearance to the wood. como dos conceptos que son los simios. And then there are two concepts, which are the monkeys and a monster that have a, a much dirtier um, aesthetic, a bit punk, I'd say, in their animation as well as in their finishing lines. And as you can see, they're like silhouettes. 
with um, red textures that I'll explain to you how we developed later on. And before we started animating, we needed to give life with animatic to those voices. We needed to dub that. So the animators are going to be using that to animate those shots. And the original version of the project is in Gal is in in uh, Gallego, a Gaelic language from Spain, uh, because Alberto wanted it to be that. And I'm going to now show you a short video of how we dubbed it in Spanish. La llaman de lejos, ¿no? María y ella. ¿Mamá? ¿Mamá? ¿Dónde estás, ¿Dónde mamá? ¿Dónde estás, mamá? ¡Mamá, estás ahí! ¡Mami! Vale. <risa> no sabe bien lo que está ocurriendo. Está más bien como asustado. Bien. Un poco asustado al inicio. Eh, vale, no. Va, la buena. La buena. <risa> ¡Son enormes! ¡Por el sagrado corazón! ¡Está todo lleno de arándanos! <risa> ¡Eh, sargento! ¡Hay un problema! ¡Los gemelos mimos y no están! ¡Han desaparecido! <risa> So there are a couple of things that need to be highlighted here. We decided that those characters should not be um, known voices. They shouldn't be classical dubbing voices. So we decided to make a difference between uh, the bears with cartoon-like voices and then the voices of the magical uh, forest um, that have normal voices that are all the feminine, all the female voices really. And, and once we started working in the production part of things, we, we started working with a bit of a delay um, on all the different parts of the movie and with all the animation. And as I was telling you previously, it was around 1,500 shots that, um, that can be seen on this wonderful image. As you can see, it has a lot of color work to them. We... It's essential, in fact, to include color concept of color that Alberto had, and we started working with those backgrounds. The backgrounds, well, we worked with people that come from the animation world, but we also like to work with people who maybe are in the world of illustration and not specifically from animation. For specific issues that I mentioned, for instance, here is the camp the bear camp with the deserted and here we have the jungle which is much more organic and makes more sense and then we have here the different vegetation patterns the unicorns are always like a silhouette and this is a, one of the sequences in the film where the bears get drugged with the magic worms and here we work with the, uh, some Catalan illustrators that we love and they did that bit of the film. This is the part of the sacred, sacred uh, book. This area of the sacred book is like done in cutout, like very much artistically to concepts uh, such as religious books, uh, codex engravings, etc. And it was a decision that we made both from the direction and the production. We believed that we wanted to reduce the budget. And here where we talk about the legend between the conflict between the bears and unicorns, we thought it made total sense to talk uh, to it's like a fairy tale idea, and that's why we use the illustrated book. Look, 
that is quicker to do and that it still makes sense but from an artistic and concept perspective. Then we have this area of, you know, the church, the monster, the monkeys had more of a dark look. This is a flashback world where we see the relationship between Azura and Nigoni, which are the main characters and that have a monochrome look. The flashbacks, which in the Azuri character make more sense, they look bluish and gory. Those emotional back uh, flashes back, it are more pinky like, and then the battle. Very short shots between twelve uh, photogram uh, between twelve frames, sorry, and a second, and then we have a more flexible area here with the flames, etc., and then with stick painting. Here you can see how we made the background quickly. In those backgrounds, we always had sequences where we had lots of people. And in those cases, we presented different characters right next to each other in order to have that idea of a mass. The layout. Well, the layout was a challenge because we couldn't do a post layout for the whole film because of personal and financial reasons. So we did the layout of only the sequences where we had masses of people and secondary characters, such as, such as these ones here, where we have different people on the screen or on the church or the bear camp, where we had to give a reference to the animators about where they were positioned, they, what they look like, etc. But also we decided to do some layer, laying in sequences where the expression or the actions by the characters were very, were very specific. Conversations but the, or actions where it was very important to have this reference, we could say, for the animators. Here you have more laying of groups of people, crowds, and then the props world. In a universe where a spectator can go into a bear camp and believe that it exists, there is a reality, and go into the emotional part of the story, that means that you have to create a universe where the urban camp is, where the, sorry, the bear camp is true, where you can sit in the air where you have all the toys, the weapons, the tools, the all the, 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 the clothes that they wear, everything had to be included, the food, the instruments, yeah. And there's something else very important that I like to highlight as a production director and executive director of the film, which is the importance of the pre-production and the importance of, and to go hand in hand with an artistic team with whom we can work and make joint decisions on the process. So for instance, there are decisions as trivial and important at the same time as developing those props. Maybe like this, a necklace may have different balls in its design or whether it should be just a string. So, but it depends because there could be a present in the film for quite a few seconds so maybe you have to draw the beams or maybe you just draw a line so we need to be aware of the importance that they have in the film all the swords in this case this with the same with all the other weapons and the grease pencil give us the gave us the opportunity to be able to optimize this there were some props that appeared a lot in the film like the arches, the hats of the high command that are always in the arms of someone and we model them in 3D and once that we did the 2D animation of the characters we positioned them and integrated it frame by frame. That meant that 
the model was always the same one. We didn't have to draw it up again. And there was just a clean up. You just had to touch it up again so that the animator didn't have to think about the model itself. It just had to position the prop on the model. That was it. With regards to the animation, I would like you to see a little video uh, from the director of the animation of Unicorn Wars. And it's a very important part in the work of in Alberto's work. He has uh, his own works, but in this case, he was in charge of the film and he's going to explain the process. Nuestro sistema de trabajo, esta película es más exigente, ¿vale? Que todas las que hemos hecho hasta hasta la fecha. So this is uh, more ambitious. The needs of the film meant that we had to use 3D, especially for the unicorn animation. Uh, there's lots of unicorns together in a film, and animating them in 2D would have been a great headache trying to find animators that are specialized on moving four-legged animals. That requires a lot of work and it would increase the budget. So making the most that we're going to use 3D software, Blender gives you the possibility to do a 2D animation on a 3D environment with a grease pencil tool. It's wonderful because otherwise, if we had gone for the same system but with a different software that's not Blender, you have to do the layout, then you have to render it, then you have to import it into a different software. So there's lots of comings and goings, and then you generate a lot of material. I mean, the good thing about Blender is they unified it all there and just stay there. In fact, the whole film, most of it, is done fully on Blender really up to the end. And this is different from other productions in which we have worked. We have seen, this is great because you don't have to be out of the software. So what Chris explained to us as I was saying, how did we get here? Well, we wanted it in our pipeline, we analyzed different softwares in the market. Here you have a comparison between what we used to do and how the grease pencil, the grease pencil works. We decided to use it like this. Here you have the development or the animation, the 2D, 3D, and the final combination of the sequence. As I was saying, I think that was the only tool that allowed us now, you know, nowadays, to uh, com make it compatible. And here you have a shot in the different stages from animatic, the background design, to the animation in wrap, the cleanup, with all the blue things where that are colored in differently, the color, the lighting, where you would put the overlay of the shadows, and the, compos the combination, the compositing. And here the same, in animation, we have different faces in the animation. We have the posing, then we have the rough animation. Uh, you can see the shot, the cleanup, as I was saying before, the blue areas are like a ghost, invisible lines that you then have to fill in in a different color for that cleanup. And then the color. And the color was done, or I'm going to show you a video so you can see the process. There's no one explaining it, but I would like you to see how we did the coloring here. <laughs>
Después de hacer el color. After the color, then we move to lighting. And here we had different techniques. The in the base, we had a normal 2D animation where we had the color layer. We did an overlay with uh, shadows over them to give that volume, and volume differences between characters. And then we had the monster, which was very different. This is the line animation of the monster. Then we did like um, coloring, basic coloring. And after that, we apply different textures to the monster. So it's very punky, kind of dark look. And then we have the unicorns, which here we have that concept of 3D. We have a basic model, we apply the light. A basic light, and then we use the grease pencil, and so we give that manual concept to integrate it better with the bare world and with those backgrounds. And here you can see the different faces for the lighting of the unicorns. This is the basic lighting from the blender and then with Chris Pencil we already have this concept and here you can see those brush strokes in the color and profile of the character itself and here you can see the light how it would work it was a challenge to try and make sure those 3D animals had that manual concept that you can see throughout the film and here you can see how or rather what we did to make sure that this 3D character could come into and uh, well to have to have it with lighting that was more easy to integrate with the bare world so here we up, took the light uh, for the unicorn and then once we had the light layer we could take it to grease pencil and from there we could touch up the lighting the thickness of the lighting on the main the type of degradé between the you know, light and the solid part of the animal. So grease line really helped us. It was very useful. We leave the music for late another day because we have no time. And with regards to the compositing, it was very important uh, for Alberto that we are up to the final compositing there we had to have that manual artistic look he said I don't want it to, to be look like the TFX and here we have some examples of things that we did and that helped us keep the concept the artistic concept that he had in mind so we have this parallel lines we wanted the film not to have fixed shots etc we wanted all to have movement but we used uh, different backgrounds with different layers and that looks like it's uh, like this like the cameras are moving like here like working like in parallel lines and then the no line process as we defined it Everything that we do has like a like a um, pen stroke. We like to to do it like this, and to make sure that it wasn't too manual, to not to clean up and then I have to remove it. We wanted to have a clean up so that it would stop exactly. Um, where there was no illumination. So you can see that fountain pen kind of look. Uh, so we took the light and we did another layer so that the line was cut automatically as if it was a fountain pen. That saved us a lot of time 
and it was a decision. And the decision was to have someone for two weeks to be able to do this automatically. And I think it really adds from a graphic perspective to the to the project and it means that we don't have to do it manually, it's automatic. For the lighting, there's a lot of the film in the forest and it has to give us the feeling that there's a lot of vegetation and that the light shouldn't be just in one single character, it should be like show volume in the different characters. So we carried out different meshes with different veg vegetation textures, some more dense than others, and we applied the mesh or grid over the characters so that you look like volume, even if the characters had no volume. And we generated different patterns with um, branches and leaves, so depending on where they were, they were different. So for instance, here they're going through a tunnel where we have bigger leaves. And that texture therefore should be different. And finally, the environment, environment effects. Fire, smoke, water, it all had to have that feeling of being done manually. And all the environment effects had also that picture-like treatment, that drawing-like treatment that I wanted. Because for me, I mean, I believe the finishing is perfect here, an example of smoke the water as well as being in contact with the stones we generated different movement patterns that you can see here these are pattern layers that have been moved over that water layer and they're not done on animal frame it's more automatic it's not on a frame by frame basis these still waters are just different Backgrounds and for the fire, we also use different um, looks of fires, different libraries of fires to in order to have that effect. Also, the rain is as if it has been drawn by hand, but it's not. And I think it's very important when you do the visual development that I mentioned at the beginning to make sure that you have a fluent communication about how you're going to do this. So that it looks like art, like it's very artistically rich, but that during the production can be mostly automated and we can do it very smartly and in an agile way. And to talk about the film, I mean, you've seen the production process. This is the end. And well, it was um, shown in the cinemas last week. And we have are going to do two things, a artwork book, which is this, that you can send on uh, book stores sold by Astiveri. And it shows a lot more about the artistic process of the film. It's ready for sale if you want it. And then a video game available for Android and iPhone for free where you can see any of the you can be any of the two protagonists and you can have fun and you can have access to exclusive um, shots of the film it's been very well welcomed the film since we started distributing it this year if you haven't watched it please it's really important that you go to the cinema and make sure that you Talk about it on the media, on the social networks, and remember that short films are quite difficult to fit in a, in a cinema plan. So make sure that you are they are in the Renoir and the Ideo film in sorry cinema. So please go and and see it and review it. And that's all. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Ya tenéis un plan. Thank you very much. So now you have your evening sorted out. You will see you here, and then you can, at night time you can go and see it. This weekend you have to watch it. Any questions?
I am Jaime from the fourth year of animation. Well, first of all, I wanted to thank you, not just for the presentation that you have just made with all the wonderful information that you've shared with all of us, very valuable information, but also I wanted to thank you for your work, because I know that the Spanish animation is in the best moment it's ever had. And I think it's extremely important to have a group of people doing cinema author cinema, adult cinema in the animation sector. And if someone is doing it right now in Spain, it's you. So please, please continue because it's amazing. Thank you. And secondly, I have lots and lots of questions, but if I had to ask you one question here and now, the one that causes more curiosity is the one that has to do with, with that I just said, which is how do you sell this concept? How do you sell it so that it can be done in Spain? Because uh, production and animation production is something very difficult to be done. And a concept such as this one is not easy. I mean, it's not easy to have a producer buy it. If you look at the same at the, at the rest of productions, you, 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 uh, uh, you well, actually, uh, um, well, so this is for you. Um, thank you. Thank you. No, I'm sorry. That's for him. It's for him. Thank you for for breaking the ice. So I said I was going to give a book to someone, so I'll give it to you. This has been a marathon race. We have been since 2009 working on, on this and, and investing in Alberto's work. We look for three main things in, in an offer. First of all, they need to have um, their own universe. They're a very specific universe that that stands out, that has something special. And in this case, I think that Alberto has it. You have seen the work that he does and everything that that lies behind it. Secondly, we want them to have stories that will make us fall in love with them. And Unicorn Wars have that element. And then thirdly, they need to talk about universal topics, topics that could be understandable, not just here, but also in the US and Japan. And the other day we were in Sitges and when we got there, I think that the greatest uh, comment that we got was, oh, this is a Spanish movie? And to us, that was like, oh, we did a good job because we were talking about the new universal concept and we did it from here and it's really cool, but we're um, open to the world. And it's very difficult. I, I think that during all of those years trying to set up the financing, we were about to just give up twice during those three years. And I think that the key point was uh, Televisión Española giving us their backup, um, the channel that really decided to invest in this project. And then we had TV Gal, TV, we have the support of ICA, um, and that's how we started to get everything, all the financing. But it was a difficult moment when we were about to give up because doing a project such as this one is actually very difficult. And having... Um, a TV channel who has a very, which has a very specific content to um, who usually they usually just bet on on the safe the, the safe bet and the winning horse but this time they have decided to risk things and now we are in about 30 movie theaters all over Spain we are in Madrid and and we see that there's only one to two seats free on the daily so it'd be lovely if they could have more more viewings but it's very difficult uh, having a movie such as this one that is so independent to have a better presence in the movie theaters but for me being able to reach a 15 to 35 year old public a 30, 15 to 35 year old audience is uh, evidence that pre uh, projects such as this one are liked and people believe in us and now instead of doing it in six years the next project will do it in three you simply have to be persistent and you have to have your own concepts and universal ideas. I basically think that's the recipe. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the book as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, having the backup of Televisión Española is really important. Uh, I mean, I, you can do it in English and yeah. don't worry. And uh, for me, what is the most uh, amazing about this film is like a story setting. Uh, so structure I started, because yeah. because like uh, so this film keep catching audiences heart and attention and uh, keep making audience surprise continuously and uh, many unique story ideas are united without contradiction so I'm 
curious about how did your team uh, create such a great story structure? I want to know the way of making, yeah, story. Okay. May I answer in Spanish? Yes, we do have a simultaneous interpretation. Um, well, I think that Alberto had something which was a clear idea. He wanted to shock anyone who watched the movie. He wanted for that audience who came to watch the movie to be personally shocked when they watched it. And Alberto is a person who, as I told you at the beginning of the talk, creates his own universe and writes the, the script as well. I do think that this is not a perfect movie because some, someone, someone told us it's, a, it's not perfect, but it's extraordinary. That's what they told us. He generates the idea of the script. We have, uh, we have a clear idea of the topics we want to deal with, war, um, family relationships, religion, power, nature. And, and there were a couple of people who helped him in the construction of that, of that storyline, that story. So we had a first scenario, we had a script, and then and then we had different scripts who helped us develop that script writers who helped us develop that script and then he wanted to do a movie that was completely different that would maintain that tension where things were happening all the time he wanted it to be a war movie and as Manuel was saying at the beginning he wanted it to be a movie with capital letters he wanted it to be cinema he wanted uh, to talk about things that are not usually dealt with in animation movies perfect one last question hello congratulations for the movie um, the only thing is that I remember when El Viento Se Levanta was premiered and 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 children uh, um, children would leave the room because it was a war movie. Have you had already complaints from parents who have taken their kids to watch Unicorn Wars and have complained because of, of it? Not that it, they have told us. I mean, I have been at sieges and I think that there were three parents with their kids and they left the room um, after the fifth minute. I mean, but we haven't received any, I mean, no one has filed a claim against us or has tweeted aggressively. No, I mean, it could have happened, but it hasn't. And, but there is an anecdote, an important anecdote that we published. Uh, we actually published the trailer in the social networks. And there was a gentleman who said, I don't understand why this kid's movie has so much blood in it. And it's actually quite relevant because some people see animation and they think, even watching the teaser, that, tri that trailer, they, they are incapable of thinking that it could not be for kids. If you see that it, there's animation, it has to be for kids. And I think that that message is quite relevant. So we have to keep on working. We have to keep on making different stories and, and try to change that, that perspective. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. And then Ivan will be around if you want to talk to him. Thank you very much.